Hi, I'm Abby. I have a lot of records. And this is Vinyl Monday. <laughs> <laughs> must fix myself. So welcome back, or welcome if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about a classic album I love. If 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds here on my channel, over on my Instagram, as well as TikTok. This week's album has been high on my list of potential episodes for a long time now. I'll be the first to admit that glam rock is a bit of a blind spot on this channel, and these guys are pretty important to the formation of the glam subgenre as a whole. But seeing as this group is still relatively obscure here in the States, at least in comparison to some of their contemporaries, it took me a long time to get a hold of this one, but it's in my collection now, and today it's getting its time in the sun. The Mambo Sun. Terrible joke, I know. Okay, this week's album is... Electric Warrior by T-Rex. Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you want to play along, all you got to do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what next week's album is going to be. I host polls sometimes. You can find all of that on my channel. All right, let's take the plastic off. So my copy is a US repress from an unknown year. Discogs doesn't seem to have it listed. This was released on Reprise over here in the States. And this copy was sent to me by one of you lovely subscribers. If you remember that vinyl haul where I was bamboozled by like 50 pounds of albums in the mail, this was in that video. Thank you, kind stranger. Now let's talk about this cover art. This was designed by Hypnosis, a name we've heard quite a few times on this channel. This artist duo of Storm Thorgerson and Aubrey Powell were a favorite amongst the 70s rockers, especially Pink Floyd. This was based on a photo of Mark taken by Spud Murphy. Here is the original. And when you consider the angle and proportion of the amp stack, the perspective is a little weird. This is the combined effect of Spud being right down in the crowd in the front row, and Mark not being nearly as tall as he looks here. With an angle like this, it'd be easy to mistake Mark for being kind of like Jimmy Page. There are lots of photos of him from this angle. But no, Mark was only five foot four. Hypnosis transformed that photo into this print, a yellow silhouette on black. There's something sort of pop art about this image, like the inverse and opposite VU and Nico. But if you're like me and you don't have an original UK copy of Electric Warrior, then you might not know that this print was originally gold foil on black. I definitely didn't know this before my research. I've only ever seen yellow and black copies like mine. And of course, the streaming services version is not gonna be gold. They had to make it kind of tan, like how they had to make the Wheels of Fire cover gray. Justice referenced this cover for their 2007 album. It features the same yellow aura on black and very steep angle of the cross. That which Justin Bieber would rip off for his album titled Justice. Like the album before it, Electric Warrior came with a poster. It was huge, 22 by 30 inches. I don't have this, but I have the image on my gatefold. We have Mark Bolin right up front and way over there in the corner is Mickey Finn. The original inner sleeve, which I also don't have, was drawn by George Underwood. He drew the Tyrannosaurus Rex album covers. On Electric Warrior, we have T-Rex on vocals, guitar, serving as principal songwriter, and with one of the oh-so-prettiest heads of hair in all of rock and roll, Mark Bolin, and Mickey Finn on backing vocals, congas, and bongos. Backing them are Steve Curry on bass and Bill Legend on drums. As far as I know, the strings players are uncredited. Special guests include Ian McDonald, formerly of King Crimson on the sax, 
Blue Weaver on Keys, and Flo and Eddie. This was the stage name of Howard Kalin and Mark Volman of the Turtles. After leaving the band, they had to change their name to Flo and Eddie to continue performing amidst legal, contractual, funkery, I don't know. Anyway, they provide the backing vocals. The string arrangements and production were both done by Tony Visconti. Roll transition. <laughs> So to get the full picture of how we got to here and to this, we must first briefly cover all that led to this. We have some new characters to introduce to the Vinyl Monday canon, beginning with Mark Bolin. Ever since he was a little kid, Mark wanted to be a rock star. American Chuck Berry and fellow Brit Eddie Cochran were his guitar heroes. Leading a band was all Mark ever really envisioned for himself. And he started really young. As the story goes, he formed his first band at age nine. At about 16, maybe younger, Mark records his first demo, no labels take the bait. In the mid-60s, he caught the folk bug and changed his name to Toby Tyler. He starts dressing like Bob Dylan, writing songs like him, and fellow Dylan devotee, Donovan. At this stage in his career, he was really vying for the Beatles label EMI to give him a shot. But seeing as the UK Dylan role was already filled by Donovan, uh, Toby Tyler strikes out once again. So he changes his name one last time to Mark Bolan. He has a brief stint with psych band John's Children until finally Decca Records gave him a shot. From 1967 to 69, he stayed on the acoustic circuit, but with a partner this time, Stephen Porter, who performed under the interesting stage name of Steve Peregrine Took. Together, they were Tyrannosaurus Rex. Aw, Deborah, you look like a zebra. That band. Side note, Tyrannosaurus Rex is a terrible band name. They did a psychedelic folk kind of thing with Mark on vocals and guitar and Steve on the bongos. Bongos are an interesting percussion choice for sure, but this would linger long past the folk phase. Psych folk was the niche Donovan had already thoroughly dominated by this point. So once again, major stardom evades Mark. But with their first couple albums, Tyrannosaurus catches the attention of BBC radio DJ John Peel. Another important character enters the story here too. Producer Tony Visconti. He moved from the States to London in the mid-60s to work under Denny Cordell, and he just kind of stayed there. Steve leaves Tyrannosaurus, but not before pulling some truly bizarre stunts on stage. Mark puts out an ad in the paper for his replacement to enter new bongoist Mickey Finn. They shorten the band's name because the fans would have done it anyway, and T-Rex is born. Out of seemingly nowhere in 1970, Ride a White Swan smacks the mainstream radio waves. This snappy little tune is one of my personal favorite T-Rex songs. White Swan was A, their first taste of mainstream success, peaking at number two on the singles charts, B, Tony's first hit single, and C, arguably the first song we can file under the glam rock name. In February of 71, after a self-titled debut album, they followed it up with Hot Love. Bassist Steve Curry has joined the party, and for those of you keeping track at home, Mark has now issued five albums by the age of 23. That is Bonkers. Hot Love really catches on with the teen audience and becomes T-Rex's first number one single. Mark was just as surprised as Fly Records were that Hot Love had the teeny boppers going crazy. Oh yeah, T-Rex changed labels again, by the way. But when you hear the song, you might not be as surprised. It's got a stick to your teeth kind of fun, complete with group vocal practically made for Top of the Pops. Around this time, David Bowie is touring the United States for the first time, mistaking Doug Yule for Lou Reed somehow, and about to start working on his own proto-glam statement, Hunky Dory. Even the cover has a similar pop art sensibility to Electric Warrior. Who had Bowie worked with? 
Tony Visconti. He played in Bowie's Proto Spiders from Mars band Hype back in 1970. Anyway, T-Rex's rise to stardom was helped along by the guitar rock craze of 1971. Releases of note are the Rolling Stones' Sticky Fingers in April. This one is in the cabinet across the room and I do not feel like getting up to get it right now. And the lingering effects of Zeppelin's folksy excursion, Led Zeppelin 3. In the spring of 71, Zeppelin have just ended their self-imposed countryside exile and are gearing up to release that body of work. As T-Rex rode this wave, Mark in particular had another advantage. Basically, the girls thought he was cute. He's not my type personally. I mean, he absolutely would be if we're going by the hair alone. But I don't know if you can tell by my voice, but I am absolutely not a small human. Mark was a small human. Short kings, I love and respect you, but I just can't do it. Mark was elven-like, with a soft, sweet speaking voice, a half-whispered singing voice, and a certain mischievous kind of sex appeal. To me, at least, he has the vibe of a character from a Midsummer Night's Dream. Not unlike another rock star who would absolutely appreciate my Alice in Wonderland teapot, Sid Barrett. Interestingly enough, Sid was one of Mark's psych rock heroes. Mark responded to this fresh-faced new fandom like any good rock and roll businessman would. He supplied the new demand. As principal songwriter of the group, he pivoted T-Rex's approach from the acoustic-based stuff they'd been doing for years at this point to stuff written for electric guitar. He simplified his lyrics to a certain degree and revisited childhood influences like Chuck Berry. As he stated in an interview ahead of Electric War, Warriors release, Mark did the rock and roll thing in part as a bid to win over the American audience. He knew hitting it big in the States was the ticket to a lot of other opportunities, namely big international tours and movies. But of course, he wrote this rock and roll stuff with a bit of his own sparkle. With fashion only getting more androgynous as we entered the 70s, he took it as the green light to really crank up the peacocking. <laughs> Under this new creative approach, Mark filled up a notebook with lyrics for about 50 songs. 17 of these would be the basis for Electric Warrior Sessions. Drummer Bill Legend rounds out the T-Rex rhythm section. In July, the crew touches down in LA to record at Wally Hader Studio. There, they link up with Flo and Eddie. Tyrannosaurus opened for them once, that's where the connection comes from. In the wake of success of Hot Love, the X-Turtles were on tour with Frank Zappa, of all people, and got back in touch with Mark. Before going into the studio, Howard, or sorry, Eddie, lent the band his home in Laurel Canyon to use as a rehearsal space. This place was a California paradise, the polar opposite of wet, rainy England in the summer. It was sunny every day, the orange trees were in full bloom, and the guys loved horsing around in his swimming pool. Back in England, recording continued at Trident Studios. This is where the strings were added to songs like Mambo Sun, Cosmic Dancer, etc. Apparently Trident had this really great warm echo to it, so it made strings in particular sound great. Ex-King Crimson member Ian McDonald recorded the sax for Get It On, as well as all the parts for Rip Off here too. It's disputed whether or not fellow progger Rick Wakeman is on this album, but according to Tony, he is not. Instead, Blue Weaver of the Amen Corner plays the piano parts. Tony realizes that both White Swan and Hot Love had strings on them, but the next intended single, Get It On, did not. Mark and Tony came to the conclusion that the strings must have been the golden ticket to these song successes, and we simply must have strings on Get It On. So in a panic, Tony throws something together on the spot. Not even composed, really. He just gave the players their notes and pointed when it was time for them to play. Every Everything's all ready for release, but there's just one problem. There's already a single out in the States called Get It On. So at the last minute, they switch up the title from Get It On to Bang A Gong Get It On. It's a difference from the UK and US versions of the album that stands even today. 
The track listing of Electric Warrior goes as follows. <laughs> Opening up side one, we have Mambo Sun followed by Cosmic Dancer. Then Jeepster, next Monolith, and side one closes with Lean Woman Blues. Opening up side two, we have Get It On, followed by Planet Queen, then Girl, next The Motivator, then Life's a Gas, and the album closes with Rip Off. Electric Warrior was released on September 24th, 1971, just a week before Mark's 24th birthday. After so much stylistic shape-shifting, it seems Mark and T-Rex only hit their stride when they were true originals. Bang A Gong was released as a single in July and goes to number one. Of course, they got a featured spot on Top of the Pops. Highlights include some of the girls visibly unenthused to be on Top of the Pops, Mickey looking quite content to be playing his big hand drums on Top of the Pops, Mark sporting chunky silver glitter on his cheeks to match his jacket, and Elton fucking John on piano. Electric Warrior was supported by tours both ahead of and after release in the UK and the US. I don't know if this was the case for everywhere, but as seen on promo material here, ticket prices were lowered in the UK so the teen audience could afford to go. And by Electric Warrior's release, they were already demoing for... The slider. In the UK, Bang A Gong and subsequent hit Jeepster sparked T Rex to see slash Bolin Mania. Though T Rex to see wasn't anywhere near the magnitude of Beatle Mania, music press of the time really marketed the band as the next Beatles. This was a huge deal. The Bee Gees, the Neck. <laughs> Claw 2 and Apple Records Act Badfinger all had the next Beatles label slapped on them at some point in time. Uh, this label seems kind of cursed in hindsight, as none could ever live up to those huge expectations. In the States, the only real T-Rex hit ever was Bang A Gong. We were still thoroughly preoccupied with the dude bro macho country blues rock thing in 71. See the Stones and Zeppelin and the Doors' LA Woman that had dropped back in April. We were booing Mott the Hoople off stage when they opened for Joe Walsh. We wouldn't get the glam rock bug until the next year with Ziggy Stardust, on which Bowie shouts out Mark Bolin. The line, they laughed at his long black hair, his animal grace, is a nod to his signature head of dark curls and primal yelping ad libs. Electric Warrior is massively influential, but not really talked about outside the glam rock sphere, which is strange seeing as it might have kinda sorta maybe been the first glam rock record. We'll get more into the mechanics of this with the chapter of the next video. Okay, what do I think of Electric Warrior? <laughs> War II bomber jet guy must be out again. Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. Going in. If you've been here long, you know about my sometimes tempestuous relationship with glam rock. For better or for worse, it was the most 70s the 70s ever got. I generally prefer something fuzzier, grittier, less done up. Uh, the prefix proto comes up a lot. Glam rock? exact opposite of that. The later glam stuff, or high glam as I call it, can be prone to technical showboating and a certain stiffness. The earlier glam statements, like Hunky Dory, Ziggy, Electric Warrior, they don't do this. Electric Warrior is surprisingly minimalistic for a glam record, and I think that's why it's more palatable to me. I really like T-Rex, and I think it's partly because of Tyrannosaurus's links in the psych folk that I love so dearly, and also because Deborah was in Baby Driver. And maybe because T-Rex hasn't been played to death on American classic rock radio like Queen has. Going in, knowing and loving the hits on this one, Electric Warrior was a big singles album. I'm not sure what 
I was expecting from the whole package. But I had a realization through my listening. The more I get familiar with glam rock, the less I see it as a rebellion against the early 70s back to basics rock thing, and the more I see it as an elaboration upon it. In my get to know you listening, as I call it, the first listen that I do while I'm doing my research, where I just throw it on Spotify or something, um, The Doors is the Changeling played a few songs after the early version of Bang a Gong, and I noticed a lot of similarities between the two. Groups like The Doors were referencing country and the blues in 71. T-Rex did a little bit of that too, but where they made that glam was in their reverence of rock and roll. Getting the weak spots out of the way first because they'll come up a lot as I cover each song. Number one. Some songs here are way too similar to each other. Mambo Sun and Planet Queen, Bang a Gong and Motivator, even Cosmic Dancer and Life's a Gas have chord progressions that are just a little too much alike. This can sometimes be a symptom of an uber cohesive record like this. I find it affects the relaxed songs here more than the uptempo ones. And number two, the writing. The good is great, but the bad is truly terrible. Lines range from charming to entirely befuddling. Not unlike Sid Barrett writing about gnomes and bicycles and mice named Gerald and shit. Now for the charms of Electric Warrior, of which there are many. In the words of my best friend Jack, Mark is, quote, fun incarnate. He really is the star of the Electric Warrior show, and the best moments are where he doesn't take himself too seriously. His husky half-sing, half-whisper might not work for everyone, especially when it's used as much as it is here. But he breaks out of it for the ad-libs, ranging from sultry to goofy as hell. The weak spots in his writing, he's an inconsistent lyricist, uh, they might not tickle everyone's fancy, but unless you outright hate joy and fun, it's really hard not to be swayed by the personality that just oozes from this record. Mark is a riff machine on the up-tempo tunes. He's a super underrated guitarist, and Electric Warrior is exhibit A of his subtle influence. You also have to remember, he's the only guitarist credited on this album. He overlaid all of these parts and is in a constant dialogue with himself. And Tony's production, it's just the right blend of pop-oriented and grit for me. Mambo Sun establishes the formula of this album. Motif, repeat it. Uncomplicated, to the point riff, uh, play the melody again in a short guitar solo. String flourishes here, bongos there. Keep it cooking to the straightforward, shoulder shimmying, ass shaking beat, and that's Electric Warrior. Am I crazy or am I hearing harmonica here? It gets gives the song a little bit of a country tint. But overall, this song feels funk. Don't believe me? Just replace a guitar part with a horn section. This song introduces another electric warrior trope, those super high falsetto backing vocals. They're consistently great for the whole record, sublime even. It's funny that something we so eagerly associate with glam came from two guys from a 60s bubblegum pop band. Beneath the bebop moon, I wanna croon with you is one hell of an opening line. We really load up on the baffling imagery from the totally nonsensical shadowless horse and alligator rain to the primal wild knees and powder keg leg. All of this stuff only works because the groove is just right. Whoa, hey, Tyrannosaurus reference. I got stars in my beard. Immediately followed up with, and I feel real weird for you. <laughs> <laughs> Cosmic Dancer is the first acoustic bass song of the record, flushed out with lovely hunky-dory-esque strings. Or maybe the hunky-dory strings are Electric Warrior-esque because Electric Warrior came out three months before, I don't know. It provides a nice backdrop for a sweet, somber poem about not fitting in and realizing you may never fit in. The narrative is non-linear by way of some wonky time skips from age 12 
12 to birth, age 8 to death, and back to birth again. It makes an otherwise pretty straightforward statement intriguing. Is it strange to dance so late, or is it strange to dance so soon? This childlike self-doubt is made profound. I almost had a oddly profound written until, is it wrong to understand the fear that dwells inside a man? Such a keen observation from someone so young. Yeah, that crosses over into truly profound. Dancing is living as a free spirit outside of societal expectations. This is what the teens of the day were doing, experimenting with makeup and androgynous dress. In response to invasive questions like, what's it like being a loon? He responds just as flippant, I liken it to a balloon, untethered and boundless. This is an unconventional, off-kilter song structure with a dynamic bass part and great little drum flourishes at the end. This song never really settles into a rhythm, and for a slow tune, it's exciting. Jeepster was my first favorite T-Rex song, and I have to read you this from my listening notes. Today I learned that a Jeepster is slang for a loser who exclusively goes after people way out of their league. Sounds like me. The cha boom cha boom drums make for a sturdy but not stiff back. This gets you up to shimmy while having plenty of wiggle room for the tune to build off of. There's a quick nod to the blues before we jump into things by way of Howlin' Wolf's rendition of Willie Dixon's You'll Be Mine. And this is maybe my favorite moment for guitar on the album. It's the most complex stuff we hear and I love the country rock licks he's infused. We have a quick breakdown for some stupid fun hand claps. If you don't do the hand claps, I do not trust you. Overall, there's more emphasis on feel than content, and I think that might be in Jeepster's favor. We have one of the strongest one-line photo caption-worthy lines on the record. You got the universe reclining in your hair, but it's sandwiched between some slightly awkward moments. You slide so good with bones so fair, and rhyming love with love. It's awkward in an endearing way, like a teenager on his first date having no idea how to conduct himself around a girl he really likes. So he puts his foot in his mouth by saying, and I'm gonna suck ya. I should cringe, but I don't because Mark is just so damn likable. Oy, then comes Monolith. What in the wheat toast hell are these lyrics. The throne of time is a kingly thing. Even if this song is a nod to the Duke of Earl, there is no excuse for that line. And the rest of the song really isn't that much better. I have no clue what it's supposed to be about, and the music doesn't really stand out. One, mm, two, mm, buckle my shoe! Of course! I love lean woman blues. I feel bad for liking it as much as I do, but after all, if you've been here, you'd know that it aligns with my tastes. She's not lean as in thin. It's her love that's lean. She's emotionally withholding. Hey Daisy Jones fans, do we think this was a possible inspiration for Tiny Love? Mark really cranks up the ferocity with this delivery. He's a lover scorned, or maybe like a big cat. Again? Not really my type, but here, I might give Mr. 5-4 a chance. The performance and the writing finally match each other. Lightning, all the heavy world is frightening. I'm like a child in the sand on the beach of the land of you, leading into my favorite solo on the album, yes! We kick off side two with the most popular song T-Rex ever had, Get it on. For some reason, I can hardly hear the strings on my mix of the album or on streaming services. I didn't register that they were there until I watched the Top of the Pops performance and suddenly heard them. They're subtle, but if you pay attention, they play something slightly different every time. That might be because Tony was just coming up with this sh on the fly. I haven't seen any other reviews pick this detail out, but the fuzz on the bass is killer. It makes the song and really beefs up what's going on with the guitars. Again, quite the set of lyrics, but much more endearing than Monolith. Hubcap Diamond Star Halo is a mental image that stumped me, but loving the Motor City the way I do, 
why I'm embarrassed to say I was swayed by this. It's a really easy groove to settle into, and once you are, it's tough to wipe the smile off your face. I 100% see why American audiences responded to the song the way they did. It was a no-brainer. Meanwhile, I'm still thinking is a subtle callback to Chuck Berry's Little Queenie, which is a really cool lead-in to Planet Queen. Gotta love glam rock's obsession with space. And again, cars. Quite the combination of interests there. I was listening to this album in the car with my buddy on the way back from our New York City trip. Aside from losing the soles of my shoes, I had a lovely time, thanks for asking. And when this song came on, he said, this is a cool song. And he's right. It's cool as a cucumber. Oh, I'm completely won over by the horny chant of give me your daughter, flying saucer take me away. On a record like this, being forgettable should be considered a high crime, and unfortunately, girl is guilty. I completely forgot this was here. Aside from the gentle horn and hypnotic sway of, oh yes you are, um, this is unfortunately homogenous. Like, it gets stuck in my head, but I don't remember anything besides the melody. The motivator is literally bang -a gong to Electric Boogaloo. I don't have much to say about this one, aside from it being a fun little shuffle. Another high point of this record is Life's a Gas. It's got a super simple, super memorable chorus. No, it really doesn't matter at all. An irreverent little scoff. <laughs> Life's a gas. Who would have thought all of two lines could be so anthemic? My favorite variation of the bunch is when we get the lyric, I hope it's gonna last tacked on to the end. It lets a hint of vulnerability through, the optimism becomes cautious. This is the strongest of the relaxed songs. It works so well that the occasional odd hyperbolic statement would go completely over your head. I could have loved you, girl, like a planet. I could have changed your heart to a star. What does that first part even mean? I don't care, because the second is just so lovely. I do wish there was some more variation in the instrumental, though. There were lots of opportunities to do so, given the openness of this melody, and few liberties were taken. I cannot believe I gaslit myself into thinking there was sax on this song like Soul Love. There really should be some. It would have made a great song perfect. As flawed as it is on paper, it's somehow one of the best songs here. Like, it should read as repetitive, but it doesn't. And that's the closing track, right? Wrong! We get smacked in the head by ripoff! This song is super interesting. It breaks the electric warrior mold in a big way. For one, Mark totally abandons the whisper sing thing. I didn't even know this was him at first. Dead ass. I thought there was a guest vocalist on this track and was so confused when I didn't find anything in the album credits. When I first heard this, I laughed out loud. Mark really let the intrusive thoughts win. He's backed by a frenzied one-man horn section in the form of Ian McDonald. It's been so long since I listened to In the Court of the Crimson King, so I honestly forgot how talented Ian was. And I get a kick out of the prominence of the bongos. Mickey was playing the sh** out of those. His rent was due. Mark sounds like he's biting his lip or gritting his teeth as he calls it as he sees it. Things like players, politicians, prudishness, and people having to live in poverty are all, well, ripoffs. Even 60s free love. If it's hers, well, it must be mine. It's a ripoff. This sweeping call out might even include all of the songs that came before this one. Okay, a quip about an oversexed pop star named Terrapin Tommy wanting to bang your gong feels familiar. Or maybe it's a call out of teen culture. I don't know. And there's that sax. Tony Visconti, tell me why I couldn't have gotten that sax on Life's a Gas. That's that's right, you can't! All in all, looking at this sequencing, I can't decide if side one or two is stronger. Uh, both have their weaknesses, whether it be a couple forgettable tunes or a straight-up 
dud. Aside from only one really bad song here, this is some crazy high quality pop writing all the way through. Electric Warrior was when T-Rex made a conscious effort to reach for their pop potential. Though they never fully realize it, this album is nevertheless a shining, brilliant star in the night. A supernova, even, as it kicked off a good chunk of how the next decade would go. Mark and company did something no one had quite managed to do before. Blend fun and flirty rock and roll with a folksy country twang, a touch of the blues, string quartet finery, and a whole lot of sparkles. It's the defining T-Rex statement, as goofy as it can be. It's charming to the nth degree and outrageously fun. By my expert testimony, I have determined it is categorically impossible to be down in the dumps while listening to this album. In such a terribly serious world, Electric Warrior is exactly what you need to reach for. My personal favorites on this one are Mambo Sun, Cosmic Dancer, Jeepster, Lean Woman, Get It On, Planet Queen, and Life's a Gas. Remember, if you wanna keep up with all of the favorites from all of the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that's it. That is Electric Warrior by T-Rex. What do you think of T-Rex? What do you think of this album? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums that I love. And remember, despite what some guy on the internet might tell you, your opinion matters. If you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next week. Bye!